O cratocone é uma doença muito desafiante, mas ainda é mais desafiante quando o diagnóstico é na adolescência. Tem a noção que é uma das doenças que na progressão na adolescência vai condicionar mais alterações na vida adulta destes doentes? Pois bem, esta é a temática deste episódio do nosso oftalmo GPS. Mas este episódio tem uma particularidade, nós vamos ter um convidado especial e o episódio vai ser em inglês, por causa do nosso convidado especial. Este é o oftalmo GPS, onde navegamos com clareza pelo mundo da oftalmologia. Hi, my name is Victor, I'm an eye doctor from ULS São José and welcome to Ophthalmo GPS. Today we're going to talk about Kratoconus, but Kratoconus in teenagers. It's, an, it's another group that is important in our, in our specialty. So, uh, with me there is Miguel. Miguel is our coordinator of the cornea and the ocular surface of our, our society. So, Michael. Hello, hello. For me it's a great pleasure to be here again in a new episode of uh, of Talmud GPS. It's very, very good for me to be here with you, Vitor, again, okay? And I'm very happy to announce that today we have a special, a special guest that uh, is Dr. Nischel, that is a very famous doctor that uh, dedicates specially on pediatric ophthalmology, ophthalmology uh, and uh, andreosegment pathology. And uh, here today we are talking about Kratoconus in pediatric patients that is very challenging to, to treat because not only the patients are not seeing very well but also have progression uh, things that we have to be to be uh, pay attention of. So Dr. Nishal, welcome to Portugal and I'm very happy to, to be here with you. So I will start to ask about diagnosis of uh, Kratoconus in pediatric patients. Um, how, what is more important for you in diagnosing Kratoconus in, this, in these patients? And uh, do you think, that we know that it's very important to diagnose very early this kind of patient because they probably will progress a lot. Yeah. So do you think, for example, genetic tests will have some kind of importance in this kind of situations? Sure. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me. I'm, it's I'm, great being uh, with you. Yeah, no, it's, it's great, great, it's great being here. What a wonderful meeting. Uh, so, look, I think um, there was there was a feeling some years ago that Visex one was the gene that was you know that could help you figure out if somebody had a genetic predisposition, but it's turned out that that's not necessarily true. So, if there's a family history, we actually end up for a research basic basis do a whole genome sequencing in the parents and the and the child or the affected members. But there is no, there's no one, two or three genes where you look for mm -hmm. that there, you know, there's going to be a predisposition. Now, there are conditions where you get character globus, like brittle cornea syndrome, mm -hmm. where we have a, a gene. We know which genes. There are two genes. One okay. is a zinc finger, and there's another one that's autosomal dominant. But they're different, right? They're different. So I think that character conus diagnosis depends on the age. Mm -hmm. If you can get a good uh, tomography or top corneal topography, then that's great. But there are some kids that you can't do that. You know, like the youngest I've crosslinked is four. Mm -hmm. Whoa. And four, four, years. four years old. And the, in that child, I, I couldn't even get her on the slit lamp. But I looked with a direct ophthalmoscope and there was an oil droplet sign. Okay. I did this um, retinoscopy and there was a scissor reflex. Yeah. There's no point watching that child. You got to take. I took the child to the OR. We have a um, we had a, um, a topography, a placido disc topographer, and it confirmed the keratoconus. And we went ahead and crosslinked, okay. right? But in the older children, I firmly believe that if you see a teenager, let's say a 13 year old, and they come and you do the, I use a pentacam. I don't have yeah. any financial interest, and you see. The back elevation is high. You see that the K max is high, like you know, over 50, mm -hmm. and you see the thinning. Um, then I I say to them, as soon as I have controlled inflammation, mm -hmm. so there must be no inflammation, and as soon as I have um, got them to stop eye rubbing, yeah, right, and I even use behavioral therapy. Yeah. Oh, you send patients for behavioral therapy because look, if you cross-link a child who's doing this or a teenager and they continue to do it, it's not going to work. Yeah. The right. mechanical deformation is too much. So once I have that, I tell them we're going. I'm giving you six weeks and we're going to go. 
for the cross-linking. Now, I'm going to tell you something that is not published yet, but I, I presented it at the ASCRS just a couple of weeks ago. We some, we, I get a lot of patients who have developmental delay, and I worry about them because th they're the ones who need this the most because they can't, you can't do a corneal transplant on them because yeah. they, can, they might self-harm, oh, right? Yeah. If you see a, ch a child or any person who has um, a cornea that's thin, let's say it's 340 microns, now, you, I know that there are sub-400 uh, protocols, Protocol. right? And you can put a contact lens and all this sort of stuff. But the nicest thing is if they have at least 400 microns, right? You go into the surgery confident. There was a paper published in 2014. In this paper, they did loading of IOP and simultaneous tomography. They looked at... Uh, 20 patients with keratoconus in one eye right. and 20 patients who had no keratoconus. In the patients who had keratoconus, as they put the IOP load up, the cone, K-max increased and the cornea thinned in real time. Okay. In the normal group, it flattened, right? Yeah. So when I read this paper, I thought, okay, I'm going to put patients, children who have a thin cornea on anti-pressure medication until I get them to cross-linking. And we are I have the paper actually as a manuscript okay. to, to check in my bag today. We did 27 children and uh, developmental delayed adults. And the smallest increase was 50 microns. The biggest, 160 microns so, over six weeks. So you can rescue them to the cross -linking. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I, we really are rushing to publish this because I think it will make a big yeah. difference. Because mm -hmm. it will give people confidence who are not, you know, who are doing cross-linking in children because they, you know, they want to do it. But perhaps they don't have the same experience as someone like you or you mm -hmm. who did a lot of adults, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's, that's one thing. The next thing is... If you are going to, let's say that they are borderline, that they definitely have some steepening uh, and the parents are a little bit anxious, I'll see them in six months, repeat mm -hmm. any deterioration and I will absolutely convince the parents to do cross-linking. Now, mm -hmm. the, the caveat is if you have a child who has 20-20 vision with glasses and they've got a mild keratoconus, that's a tough one because for me, I like to see some interface haze because the interface haze means that the cone is flattening. Mm -hmm. it's, it's happened. Right? The, the, the reaction is happening. Exactly. Now, in some of my adult colleagues, they don't like to see interface haze. Then they put a lot of FML, for example. Yeah. I don't do that. Okay. Because if, especially developmentally delayed uh, teenagers and adults, they don't want to wear glasses. Yeah. And so if you can get the cone to flatten, it improves their daily living activities. And the same for teenagers, you know. If a teenager can get away with glasses rather than a contact lens, they prefer it. And I do too. Because whenever you put a contact lens on, you always get some apical scarring. Okay. Don't you? Yeah, always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit. Yeah. So, so, so you don't do cross-linking to, to all of the, of the shadows when you do the diagnosis. In some, kind, in some cases, in mild cases, you just I will watch wait for six months. So, but that's the minority. Okay. Okay. The majority the, of children you go on make the diagnosis and, cross, -linking. And cross linking And you treat the inflammation because you think treating the inflammation will get better results after cross -linking? Yes, better Maybe. results so you, you and reduces the rubbing. Okay. okay. Reduces the 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 rating. Rating. Okay. So what is your scheme for the anti-inflammatory in that patients? So um, I, I give them uh, opatinol, okay. 0.7%, because then it's once a day. Yeah. I will also start them on restasis if there's a lot of inflammation. Okay. Okay. And, and they often get dry eye as well, right? So I give them restasis, and then I start them on a preservative-free anti-glaucoma, okay. either uh, Koshopt okay. uh, or, the, or Bramonidine, okay. and sometimes okay. both, both to get the really... So I had a child whose um, one eye had got a little bit of scarring and his thickness was 260 microns. His other eye was 380. I put them uh, on medication. I did the first eye cross-linking. On the table, the... Um, the thickness was 460 microns. Okay. But in the 260, 
I got 410. So here's a child where I was not going to crosslink, and now I'm like, Whoa. I'm going to crosslink. It's just, extraordinary. Just with the treatment, just inflammatory with treatment, yeah. And also stopping them rubbing the eye. Yeah. There's a very, there are a couple of very interesting papers coming out. I've been a reviewer for them where they looked at the gut microbiome. Ah, okay. Right? And they looked at the metabol metabolomics mm -hmm. of um, inflammatory uh, markers. And they found that uh, your, your gut microbiome can tell you if your ocular surface is going to be more inflamed. There's certain markers that okay. you can look at. And if you have those markers, you are more likely to get keratoconus. Oh, so yeah. I think we're heading down the road where, you know, somebody's going to come for a keratoconus and we're going to look at their poo. <laughs> <laughs> so in my experience, I, I, I know that when I do the anti-inflammatory therapy before the cross-linking, I will, I will get a pause-up much better, a much better pose-up, less, less complication in the pose-up. It's the same with, with teenagers and yes. kids for yes, you? Yes, absolutely. Now, one thing I want to say is in the United States where I am, and I'm in an academic center, I can only do the FDA approved. Ah, okay. So I do uh, Epi-Off, Epi -off. right? And I have to Me do too. the- Me too, I only do Epi-Off. I, I, yeah, and, and, and I do the full Dresden. I don't have, a, I don't have the ability to do That's accelerated okay. yet. I'm working on getting a, an exemption on that. But he, there's a little trick I want to tell you. You know, some teenagers, especially boys, they find it too painful, even if you put a bandage contact lens on. Okay. Now, I learned this for developmentally delayed adults. You can imagine, they get very violent if they can't express themselves. So what I do is I do, with 4-O-Proline, a temporary central tarsorophy okay. for three days. And I, re I reverse it in the clinic, Okay. And they are calm, there is no pain, okay. and they, uh, they all are healed. I think we had one patient who healed a day after I reversed okay. the tarsorophy. Now, I'm not saying you should do that, the tarsorophy, in every child, but if you give the teenager an option, I have 50-50. Okay. A yeah. normal teenager, normal development, 50% say, I'll take the contact okay. lens. Very good point. And 50% go, close my lips. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, regarding the, the progression, uh, when you wait and see, uh, do you have uh, any strategy regarding the, uh, what is progression for you? So, some cut in, in, in some cut some cut -off. If I get K-Max two diopters or more, mm. I'm done. Because mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you can get between visits, one to, one to two, di one to just under two yeah. diopters, and yeah. I've seen that change, depending on how what the fixation yeah. is, et cetera. Varies a lot, yeah. Right? But if it's more than two diopters, it's, and the it's thinning, significant. yeah, and the thinning is more than ten microns, mm -hmm. the two together for sure. Look, I don't use the D score. Some people look at the yeah, D score, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think you if for refractive is. surgeons that's helpful. I have for not. For no. I have yeah, not yeah. found that I, to be helpful. I have the same opinion. Okay. Yeah, the same. The same See, course. I want to move to Portugal. Does everybody <laughs> yeah. agrees with me? <laughs> Regarding the corneal transplant, sometimes you don't, you have, so regarding the corneal transplant, when you have yes. a kid that uh, really needs to improve vision uh, and, and seek for a solution, uh, do you have any cutoff in kind of age or when you do the transplant? So, for example, in my experience, I usually wait for 18 years old. Oh, I see. Rarely a little bit before, but I feel more comfortable after that, that age. Do you have any So sure, I don't really have a, I, I do DALC mm -hmm. uh, and I use viscodissection, Gillette Mele's uh, technique of yeah, viscodissection. I know, I know. And I have an intraoperative OCT. Oh. So I'm able, uh, uh, when I do the DALC, uh, I can see the decimates being peeled off. Mm. Now, if there's a scar, I have to stop before I get to the scar and then manually, okay go Using through the steps. scar yeah. so they have a little mark at them okay. the, but it's so but i you know i have i'm trying to think i i, I have not i have I, maybe i've had to do three yeah i, I because i'm, I'm aggressive about the cross linking Making. okay and you let them use the contact lenses as much as it, as they can absolutely it's, it's it's your rule right yeah, yeah. okay and if, I, if they're I good a, with the contacts absolutely the and contacts. i have a very good contact lens practitioner yeah. who will try like you know the gas permeables yeah. but often we'll do the hybrid with the scleral skirt i think that teenagers are more prone 
to our ad adopt the contact lenses than the adults. I, I suppose I agree they, with are, you. they are more prone to that, that they, use. They are, yeah, they are much, much more. And then, you know, there's this contact lens, uh, I don't know the name of it, where there's a, a scleral skirt and then there's a hard, and it, it vaults. Yeah. But you can put liquid in it and it makes it really comfortable, okay. really comfortable. So, yeah, I agree with you. I think that they are, uh, they are much better at uh, uh, adapting yeah. to contact lenses. And adults. Do you have any, any message that uh, you should uh, say to the general ophthalmologist regarding the prevention of keratoconus so we can avoid uh, reaching the and the I think and the that um, if you see a child with allergies, right, or atopic dermatitis, Ask them specifically if they rub their eyes. Look for keratoconus. If they don't have it, tell them not to rub their eyes, but review them in six months. Because these are the children who really, eye rubbing is, has a big role in pediatric keratoconus. Look. And I, I, I would like to tell you a story. When I got to America, I had been doing cross-linking in the United Kingdom. I got to America and the insurance companies would not cover cross-linking in children because they said it was experimental. I had to write an editorial in the Journal of the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology Strabismus saying cross-linking in children is not experimental and giving all the evidence around the world. So I think general ophthalmologists need to know that you can cross-link children okay. and it, it is effective. Now, I, the only two patients I've had to re-cross-link have been children. One was a 12-year-old, I had to recross link at 16, and one was a 16-year-old, I had to recross link at 19. But the rest, it's been really yeah. good. Yeah. But, and you consider uh, sending the patients to a pediatrics or, or, um, or general allergology. medicine, allergology, to, to treat the systemic disease? Yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, um, uh, an allergy specialist, yeah. for yeah. sure. Yeah. For sure. And then the other thing is, most children prefer GA. I have teenagers I've done awake, okay. um, but I have the ability to put them to sleep, so I offer it to them okay. and give them a, a choice. Okay, and and and, and uh, for in, in in regard of the cross thinking, in the pause op, in the pause op, some 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 patients tell about doing vitamin C or yes. okay, what do you think about that? I, I have not had to use it. I've read a couple okay. of the studies. It seems like it's a reasonable thing to do, uh, but. I'm, Many parents I'm, ask me about the evidence of that, and I mix feelings. And well, yeah, it's a little bit, it's, I wouldn't say it's controversial. There, the two studies, one showed that it had a positive effect, the other showed that it didn't make any difference yeah. with placebo. So I, I don't use it. Yeah, I don't okay. use it. So our last question is regarding this issue, what is your three rules that, you, that all ophthalmology must, must follow in this, in this in cartoconus in teenagers? What do you think? The three main rules. The, the first rule is to be aware that it can occur in children and teenagers. If you're not aware, you're not going to look for it, right? Okay. First. Second, if you can get a topography or a tomography, do that. And if you can't do, get that, just look with a direct ophthalmoscope, not with a slit lamp, because the direct ophthalmoscope will pick up early keratoconus like that. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for, for this time talking about a very important topic, keratoconus in pediatric patients. It's very, very good for, for me to be here with you and with Vitor once again in a new episode of, uh, of Tomo GPS. And uh, I hope to, to see you soon. <laughs> yeah, thank Great, you so Ken, much. It was amazing, like yeah. usual. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Espero que tenham gostado, espero que tenha sido um episódio interessante para vocês. Uh, nós aqui adorámos estar com, com o professor Kenichel, foi espetacular. Uh, nós temos este episódio disponível no site da SPO, nas nossas plataformas habituais, YouTube, Spotify. E não se esqueça de subscrever, de fazer like, de nos dar o seu feedback. É muito importante para nós, para nós podermos continuar com o projeto e podermos crescer mais. E este foi o Oftalmo GPS, onde navegamos com clareza pelo mundo da oftalmologia. Música